Spine, the cusp BC, September the 17th, 1960. Uh, this is Ross Fleming speaking for Fleming Recordings, and we're about to interview Mrs. C.S. Leary of the cusp, who has been in this district for some time and is spending a little holiday in the Arrow Lakes Hospital with a broken bone in her foot. So uh, we are doing this recording in the hospital uh, bedroom. Uh, Mrs. Leary, uh, where were you born? Uh, I was born here in the cusp, Mr. Fleming. Uh, right in the cusp? Yes. And uh, when was that? In 1898. In 1898? Have you any uh, coincidence with that? Oh yes indeed I have. That was the year the Minto was launched. The Minto and I both slid down the ways the same year. <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's very interesting and um, so that uh, you're a native a daughter. Yes. And uh, now you went to school and uh, your school days were in the cusp? And, uh, and uh, at All Hallows in Yale, B.C. Oh yes, and uh, and then what uh, occupation did you follow? Uh, well, I became a, a student nurse in the Kootenai Lake General Hospital uh, in 1918 and graduated in 1921. And who did you? Who was the matron then? Uh, Miss MacArthur, Miss Anne MacArthur. I think I was her first probationer in the new, which was then the new hospital. And uh, could you get, name us some of the other nurses that were there then? Uh, yes. Just a few of them. Uh, there was um, Mabel Groom and uh, Pearsall and Stewart uh, of Nelson. We used to call her Stewie. And, uh, oh, my goodness, there are so many right now. It's hard for me to remember them all. Miss mm -hmm. uh, McGaughy and... Uh, Oh my, there's so many, I yes. think I'm forgetting Well, them. That, that's fine. That, uh, now I suppose uh, Mr. Leary had to come along, uh, Mr. Sid Leary uh, had to come along and, uh, and interrupt your, your uh, work at the hospital, did he? Well, I had graduated and uh, yes, we were married shortly after the war, after he returned from the First World War. Uh, were you married in uh, Casper or Nelson? We were married in Edgewood. In Edgewood? Yes. Oh, yes. And uh, uh, Mr. Leary was a uh, member, uh, member of provincial parliament for some time, wasn't 16 he? 16 years. What party was he with? With the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. For 16 years? Yes. Yeah. Under what uh, uh, government or what premier? Well, he began with uh, John Oliver and Dr. McLean and uh, T.D. Patello. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, is there any other interesting thing that you would like to uh, mention in regard to Mr. Leary before we get down to some of your own private well, uh, that he led a very, uh, very active life, as you know, here on the Arrow Lakes. He began his career with one horse and uh, worked his way up and uh, to quite a going concern here on the Arrow Lakes. He the uh, followed the lumbering business. That's didn't he? right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he did. He have his. He had his own mills at the. At the finish. Oh yes, mm -hmm. yes. The the uh, White Pine Lumber Company and then the Big Bend Lumber Company. Mm -hmm. What year was it that he passed away? In, um, in 1950. 1950. In Florida. In Florida. Well, ten years ago now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, now uh, would you tell tell us something about some of your interesting. Uh, the episodes in your life? Well, Mr. Fleming, I think we were very privileged as children. We were a large family. There were nine or ten of us. And uh, in the early days here on the uh, Arrow Lakes, uh, we had uh, we were brought up with a horse in one hand and a gun in the other. 
and uh, the, the whole country seemed to be ours to do with as we liked. We lived uh, a very, very free and open life uh, with not many ties, uh, fishing and uh, hunting and horseback riding and so on. And we uh, had a great deal of experience with the early Kootenai Indians who uh, used to make this their uh, hunting ground at different uh, seasons when the fishing was good. I often tell my own children they missed one of the greatest romances in British Columbia uh, as we saw it because we were privileged to watch these uh, Indians coming up the river in their birch bark uh, river uh, canoes, the long uh, canoe. The flat bow uh, boats, uh, Well, they were pointed at both ends. Yes and very long and uh, they were made of the real birch bark they would come up in a great flotilla and uh, come into the bay here at Nacusp and then they would uh, uh, take uh, unload the canoes and if any of them needed repair the old chief who was Louis Kootenay used to be the foreman of the job and uh, we used to watch him boiling the pitch in the old cans and uh, teaching the young bloods how to uh, uh, repair the birch bark canoes mm -hmm. with the birch and it was most interesting while the clutches used to sit around on their haunches doing beadwork on the beaches oh, yeah. so uh, this generation are missing uh, that lore that we had the great privilege of seeing I look back on those days and uh, I would really like to write about them, and they were so romantic. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I wish you would. It, it takes time to do these things, mm -hmm. but uh, it would be very nice if you could. Uh, that puts me in mind of uh, a story that Dudney told about uh, coming up the Kootenai River, and uh, uh, he had some Indians with him, and uh, when they were drawing out the shotgun, uh, out of the bow of the boat. The gun accidentally went off and blew the part of the bow off the boat. And in no time, the Indian had, uh, had gone out into the woods and got the, the bark and, uh, and the pitch and had it repaired. And off, <laughs> off they went again. <laughs> yes, I can quite see it. <laughs> you can understand that. Yes. <laughs> and now, uh, I suppose, uh, in those days, there are quite a few wild animals. Oh, yes, indeed. We had the game almost uh, to our back door. I remember one night uh, looking out uh, through the back door, and here were a couple of coyotes right here in the cusp, almost in the in the chicken yard. Well. Wow. And uh, the whole thing was, uh, as I say, a wonderful game mecca for anyone. And I should tell you at this point, I think, about uh, a thrilling bear story, which I think is a thriller and I believe to be true because my husband told me so, so it must be. <laughs> he told it many times and he never varied a word. Uh, this happened down at a little uh, place called Burton, Burton City. He had a little home there and a little spaniel. And in the fall of the year, he started out one day to uh, uh, look for a few grouse and he'd been gone most of the afternoon and no luck. So the little dog was prancing around as though he wanted to really flush something. So a big owl flew by and uh, out of uh, sympathy for the dog more than anything, my husband up with his 22 and popped the owl. He was la uh, sitting on an old cedar, but he didn't fall. And uh, my husband couldn't understand this, so he put the gun against the tree and he pulled himself up the old dead branches of the cedar and uh, peered down in because he surmised it must have fallen in as it didn't fall out. Mm -hmm. And while he was looking down curiously into the stump, the top gave way and he was precipitated into the bottom of this old hollow cedar stump. So he was in a terrible quandary. There was the owl all right, but how was he going to get out? Mm -hmm. So after he'd got himself righted, he looked up and uh, he really didn't know what to do. He remembered he had a small jackknife in his pocket, mm -hmm. but that's all he had. 
And uh, so he got uh, this thing open and he, he began with the large blade to try to work a little footing for his fingers through into this hollow stump. And he was progressing but he uh, fairly well, but he felt he must take it easy because he was depending his life on that blade. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately he got working a little too hard and the blade broke. So there he was, uh, with nothing left but this little tiny uh, blade, and he knew that was impossible. So he sat there with the uh, sweat rolling off his face, thinking about all his sins and <laughs> wondering how in the world it was all going to end, when the little dog began to yap violently outside the tree, put up an awful howling, and then all of a sudden was quiet. So uh, he couldn't understand that, and that had him worried. And presently he heard coming up the outside of this old stump a scratching noise. And uh, he said, well, I really thought the old devil was after me, but I, I stood there and, and waited. And he said, finally, I kept looking up, and the top was obliterated. All was darkness, and the air became very uh, close, and I knew something was coming down this old all stump mm -hmm. and it suddenly dawned on me I was in the den of a bear this oh. old hollow cedar you see oh, so he said all I could do was stand and wait mm -hmm. so with this knife in one hand with the little blade open mm -hmm. and waiting just with my breath baited mm -hmm. uh, this bear came down backwards as they do mm -hmm. and when he got just about reaching distance he said i made one mighty leap and with the blade of the small knife i jabbed him in the rear and he said the bear took me right up to the top of that stump <laughs> and when he didn't even wait he just took off head first right off the tree okay. and me behind him but he said i held and the bear went down and as a result at the foot of the tree was a dead dog a dead bear and my gun thrown way off. Now that's the bear story. <laughs> oh, that's a, <laughs> well, now that's a wonderful story. Uh, but uh, did it? Uh, did the knife find a vital spot? In oh it? yes, indeed. He said he yelled like a wild Indian, and he drove that little blade just as hard as he could drive it. Uh, and he uh, he landed on the bear too, and he he grabbed the bear by what he thought it was the bear's tail. You oh, see, yeah. he grabbed him and hung on for dear life. I see. <laughs> and, uh, and the bear took him to safety. And the bear took him out of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think that's a, that's a bear story to top all bear stories. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid if I ask you for any, uh, any more bear stories or any other stories like that, it might uh, uh, seem tame according to that. But did you have any other uh, similar instances? Uh, well, uh, he had another uh, bear story. I don't know, really. It's uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, whether you would be interested in hearing it, would oh, you? Oh, yes, sure. Well, this, this took place up McDonald Creek, which is just about uh, eight or nine miles south of Nacusp. And this was in the very early days, and an old trapper by the name of Bob Falls had a trap line. Oh, yeah. So, uh, he, of course, he came out very little, and my husband, knowing him very well in, uh, from Burton, he thought it would be uh, a very nice gesture if he took a, his mail and uh, probably a little Mickey of rum up to see the old trapper. So up he went, and uh, it was a day, weather just like we're having now, beautiful sunshine. Of course, we get a lot of that, you know, in this country. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> we have to boost it, you That's know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was weather, I imagine, just as we're having this fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said as he got close to the cabin, he was going up the draw, he could, it was so clear, so beautiful, that he could even get the aroma of the bacon as it was frying in the old trapper's cabin. So he hoo-hooed and hollered, and the old trapper, Bob Falls, came out and answered back. And in a few minutes, he was inside the cabin. And uh, Bob was very delighted to see him, and uh, he was had an old pot of black beans there and, and coffee. You know, they didn't live very elegantly, those old trappers. Oh, no. 
But, and this little bitty place was only, had two little tiny lights in it, and it would only accommodate two people at the very most to sleep. So he decided that he would stay the night with Bob, and uh, Bob was busy skinning some of the pelts he had got that day. And uh, as he was talking, he said, Now, Sid, if you're going to be around in the morning, I must caution you, because he said, I've run across the tracks of a huge grizzly. The last three days, it's right close to my cabin here. So be very careful. Of course, my husband never moved without his rifle, so he had it with him. And uh, when the morning came, Bob went off to the trap line long before daylight. And uh, Sid said when he finally wakened, the sun was streaming through the little lights. And he roused himself and thought he'd take a saunter off and see if he could see any game at all. So he uh, uh, went along, and as uh, he was traveling, he was right up on the far reaches of McDonald Creek where you can look right down onto the uh, Arrow Lakes, and it looks just like a ribbon. It's so very beautiful. And uh, he said there was, had been a fresh fall of snow uh, through the night, just a skim, and he, the scenery was so beautiful, he just whipped the snow from the log and sat down to glory and nature's beauty. And uh, while he was sitting there, uh, something uh, very uncanny, which does happen to anyone that's used to the woods, out of the tail of his eye, just the corner, he saw a slight movement. And he said he didn't move his head, he sat perfectly still. And again, this little tiny movement from the corner of his eye. So very slowly he turned his head. And there across a windfall, oh, I should imagine it was about 150 yards from him, or probably 200 yards, he said was the biggest, the head of the biggest grizzly he's ever seen. All he could see was the head. Mm -hmm. So he said, I didn't have to move from that log. I sat absolutely still and slowly raised my rifle and I took a good aim on him, and I fired. And he disappeared completely. And he said, I sat there for quite some time, and no movement, no sign of the bear. So uh, after a uh, considerable time of waiting, I decided to walk toward, toward the where he had been. And after I got a little way, he said, I thought the better of it. I thought, now he might be wounded, and I'm very foolish, he's a big one. Mm -hmm. So he said, I retraced my steps, but something made me turn. And I looked back quickly, and here he was coming for me, on all fours, just as hard as he could come. So he said, the first time in my life I ever lost my head, and he said it was the size of the brute that made me do it. I threw my rifle. And uh, he said, all I could think of was making for the first tree I could find. So he said, I did. I just had, it for, just had time to reach this tree and was swinging myself up, as I thought, clear of the bear, when lo and behold, a branch broke. And I was precipitated right down under the bear's nose. Well, here's what happened doesn't remember any more until old Bob Falls was pushing snow down the front of his shirt. He'd come home and no sign of Sid and he'd seen by the snow skiff where he'd gone out and hadn't come back. So he lit up the old candle bug, you know, that they used mm -hmm. to carry. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, he lit up the old bug and he started out to uh, track Sid's uh, steps through the snow. So Here's what he saw, a dead bear, Sid Leary lying in a pool of blood. And of course he thought the worst had happened. Mm -hmm. So what had happened, that bear was shot right through the heart. Oh. He had expended every bit of his last strength to reach him and hit him a swiping blow across the head as he fell and he was all torn across the shoulder knocked out completely, and he was dazed for two or three days, he didn't wow. uh, remember, but he was all right. He mm -hmm. came to, and Bob got him back to the cabin.
And he said he sold that hide to an American for the greatest price he'd ever sold any grizzly oh, in his life. That's all. <laughs> because of the story behind it. But he was a monster. Yes, that's it. Yes, he was. Well, that, that is certainly a... <laughs> So those are my two stories. Well, that, those, those are pretty good. Now, I don't think that we'll have anybody that can top that. <laughs> now, uh, before we go any farther, I, uh, I'm, I'm afraid we're neglecting your family tree now. Uh, what is your maiden name? Uh, my name was Jordan. Uh, your, your maiden name was Jordan? Yes. Full name? Florence Jordan. Florence Jordan. Mm. Uh-huh. And uh, your uh, father was uh, one of the early day merchants here? Yeah, that's right. I remember the name, uh, although I had no association with McCusp, I remember seeing it in the newspapers, yes. of course, at different times. He came in here in 1893, and my mother came with him like she was just a bride. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, and we were all born here pretty well. May have been two of us born in New Denver because there was no doctor. Yes. But we otherwise would all have been born here. Well, we certainly will have to have a, a recording of your mother whenever she gets back to the cusp. Oh, I do hope you will. Yes, because mm -hmm. uh, she uh, would have a treasure of memories. Uh, then, uh, after your father uh, died, uh, your mother married again? Yes, she did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what was her...? Uh, uh, she married William Williams. William mm -hmm. Williams, oh yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that name is not so familiar with me. What uh, was his occupation? Well, he lived at Edgewood. Oh, yeah. Uh, his father was a farmer at Edgewood, mm -hmm. and we had a large farm down there. Oh, yes. My father had it for many years. It oh, was yes. sort of a holiday. Oh, yeah. to all of us as children and sure, that's where we had uh, such happy times with our horses and so mm -hmm. on yes well now uh, you uh, make uh, Nakas pretty well your home now yes uh, all the time yes and oh the roots are too deep to <laughs> leave <laughs> yes. uh, well uh, it seems to me that there's great development uh, coming and it'd be yeah. a shame to to uh, pull up the roots, as you say. As long as they don't wash us out with a high arrow well, or something. Well, I'll say... Uh, that I would be a tragedy. Point. It would. Yeah. It certainly would. Tragedy. I, I think that uh, uh, there'll be an awful uh, uh, lot of opposition to that, mm -hmm. I would think. Uh, well, now I wonder if there is anything else that, uh, that we can think of. Oh, uh, I just wanted to ask you, in regard to the early days... Uh, the uh, game w was plentiful. Uh, what about the fishing? Was the fishing oh, fairly plentiful? Oh, e excellent. Yes. Uh, that was, of course, before all these dams uh, were in mm -hmm. on the river, you know, yes. and oh, the fishing was wonderful. Of course, it's still very good, you know. Mm -hmm. We still have marvelous fishing here on the Arrow Lake. Is that so? Oh, well, yes. Oh, that's mm -hmm. good. Well, we haven't on the Kootenai Lakes. Mm -hmm. I, uh, We'll have to import some of your water, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, of course, we read uh, in the Indian stories about them going to these uh, different places and uh, uh, making their winter's catch of fish and yes. drying them and yes. so on. Well, of course, they used to uh, uh, be particularly fond of the little, uh, many people call them the kinnikinnicks, you know, the little redfish. Oh, yes. Uh, before they before go they up go the red. rivers, they, of course, they are the landlocked salmon. Yes. And their meat is very red, and mm -hmm. they're delightful eating. Yes. They're delicious. Yes. Mm -hmm. I remember catching them down at the city wharf in Nelson before, yes. uh, before the run of redfish. Yes. And, uh, we call them the silver trout. Yes, well, that's <laughs> right. Yes. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mrs. Leary, for this uh, wonderful interview and those wonderful uh, bear stories. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of these days, uh, this is live will be on the air, and uh, we'll let you know when, uh, when it, it will be broadcast. And because uh, we have the three... Uh, mm -hmm. Stations, I believe you get uh, around in the cusp here. You get uh, CJT at Trail fairly well. And not too well, not unfortunately. Too well. No, mm -hmm. we're very handicapped with the radio and oh, of yeah. course TV mm -hmm. too. Well, of course Nelson is out of your reach mm -hmm. and Cranbrook is out of your reach. So our only hope is uh, uh, Trail, 
And of course, sometimes radio reception is better than others, and we hope you strike a good day. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks very well, much for this wonderful interview. You're welcome. It's been pleasant. Oh, Mr. Fleming, just before we uh, conclude this interview, I would like to say it's really been a great pleasure to see you today after so many years. I can remember you uh, in the days when I trained in Nelson in the hospital there. You were one of our real city fathers. It seemed to me there couldn't be much take place without Ross Fleming. <laughs> and although we both have a few uh, white hairs since those days, uh, believe me, you were a going concern uh, on the band and so on, and you looked pretty snazzy in that uniform. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much. That, uh, they are pleasant memories, and uh, thanks for those kind words. <laughs>